Hello, folks and goats. My name is Griffin, and welcome to the Command Valley for our Strixhaven Precon gameplay video. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. First off, this episode and this podcast is sponsored by GameGrid. If you're looking for any of the Precon decks, then head on over to GameGrid's website where you can order them, get them shipped directly to your house, and support the podcast at the same time. So that link will be in the description box below. Additionally, this show and this episode is brought to you by you and our Patreons at patreon.com slash commandvalley. If you're looking for the best way to support us, then head on over to patreon.com slash commandvalley and consider joining up with one of our tiers. And lastly, we have had the unique opportunity to be reached out by Dragon Shield to show off some brand new sleeves featuring the Hogwart houses that will be releasing on May 28th. So we will be playing this game with the Dragon Shield and we're very excited for that. Landon and I and many of the other podcast members only use Dragon Shields. So if you want to get these, then they will be releasing on May 28th for you guys to purchase. Additionally, we feel that these sleeves are absolutely perfect for this specific precon game as the Hogwarts is obviously a magic college or magic school, if you will, and Strixhaven happens to be a magic school. So it was very fitting for Dragon Shield to send us these sleeves and they are gorgeous. So we, we are super excited for you guys to see them. And thank you very much for Dragon Shield for giving us this opportunity. Definitely, if you are looking to get one of these Strixhaven precon decks, then consider getting those Hogwarts house sleeves to deck out your deck in the house of your choice. All right, Landon, let me pass off to you for our deck introductions. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm super excited for this game. Only unfortunate thing is there are five pre-constructed decks and only four of us, so one did have to sit out. Caleb is playing Barina from the Silvercoil Statement deck, and his opening hand consisted of an Orzhov Signet, a Victory Chimes, a Nils Disciple Enforcer, a Hunter Lamasu, and three planes. Now, this deck is kind of a political deck. It's trying to use all different types of political ploys to keep himself aloof from everything else at the table, while also at the same time staying very involved. And Caleb decided that the Slytherin sleeves matched the Silvercoil Statement statement deck and that is what he is using. Next up we have Griffin piloting the Osgear the Reconstructor from the Lorehold Legacies deck and his opening hand consisted of a Steel Overseer, a Sculpting Steel, a Scrap Trawler, a Command Tower, Phyrexia's Core, Ancient Den, and a Plains. This deck is all about using Osgear's activated ability to copy artifacts from your graveyard getting twice as much value and outvaluing your opponents all the way to victory. And Griffin decided that the Gryffindor house fits Lorehold the best, so he took the Gryffindor sleeves. Also, his name's Griffin, so what else did you expect? <laughs> Next up, we have Landon piloting the Witherbloom Witchcraft deck helmed by Willow Dusk Essence Seer. His opening hand contained an Arcane Signet, a Druidic Satchel, Essence Pulse, Sproutback Trudge, two forests, and a swamp. This deck is all about life manipulation to the benefit of the deck, either gaining a bunch of life in one turn or losing a bunch of life in one turn so that Willow Dusk can make your creatures super huge. And Landon decided that the Hufflepuff sleeves fit this deck the best, so that is what he chose. And finally, we have Peter, who is piloting the Quantum Quandrix deck, helmed by Adrix and Nev, the Twin Casters. His opening hand consisted of Cassetto, Orochi Archmage, Kodama's Reach, Hornet Queen, Exotic Orchard, Novigen, Heart of Progress, a Forest, and an Island. This deck is all about making as many tokens as possible and using your commander to make twice as many tokens. It's honestly the most straightforward, I would say, of all the decks. And he decided to take the Ravenclaw sleeves. All right, thank you so much for those introductions, Lennon. When, without further ado, let us begin the game. And just keep in mind as you are watching the games, look at how beautiful those sleeves are. They honestly are just so beautiful and they shuffle so well. I'm just so happy with Dragon Shield and their quality. Another interesting thing to note about these art sleeves and also just like all the other art sleeves that Dragon Shield makes, if you've used other art sleeves from other companies, they always split like right at the back when you try and shuffle with them. That never happens with Dragon Shields. They've literally perfected the art of putting art on the back of sleeves. So I thought I would point that out too. And without further ado, Lennon will be doing the play-by-plays and I, Griffin, will be doing the side-by-side -side commentary. So without further ado, for the second time, enjoy the game. All right, Caleb starts us off. He draws, lays down a planes and passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws, sets down his command tower and ships the turn to Landon. 
Landon draws, grows a forest, and passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws and grows a forest of his own and passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb draws and plays on a plains and taps both of his lands for an Orzov signet and ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down the artifact land Ancient Den and taps both of his lands for a Steel Overseer. Kind of a scary looking scarecrow, dude. Honestly. What, Steel Overseer? Yeah, it kind of looks like a scarecrow. With like a chainsaw. He does not. He looks like an overseer made of steel. Okay. And he passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws, plays down a swamp, and taps two for an arcane signet, and ships the turn to Peter. Peter draws and plays down an untapped exotic orchard, and ships the turn back to Caleb. I just want to say I am very impressed with these pre-con decks. A lot of the time when you play a pre-con deck, you might not find yourself casting something until turn three, but with these pre-con decks with the elevated ramp packages and card draw packages you'll see more plays coming out earlier which is very important to keep up with the meta that is already out there caleb untaps and draws and plays on a planes as his land for turn and decides to be the first person to bring their commander into play this is a very spicy commander because this effect happens with all of your opponents including you this can trigger off of multiple opponents if those opponents have more life than another of your opponents and you will see that brina can get very big very quickly and with nothing left to do Caleb passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a planes and taps three mana for Lelia, the Blade Reforged. Since she has haste, he heads to combat, swinging her at Peter. On attack, Lelia triggers and exiles Lashiel Clockwork Scholar from the top of Griffin's library, giving him the option to cast it until the end of turn. Lilia will also trigger and get a plus one plus one counter for a card being exiled from the top of his library. Peter then takes the damage, dropping down to 37, and with nothing left to do, Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a forest and taps three mana for a druidic satchel. Feeling very happy with his new swag, Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down an island and taps three mana for a Kodama's Reach, reaching into his library to put an island into play tapped and a forest into his hand. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb begins his turn by untapping and drawing and lays down a planes. He heads into combat, swinging his commander Brina in the air at Griffin. And on attack, he's going to put two plus one plus encounters on Brina and draw a card. Griffin takes three damage, dropping down to 37. In his second main phase, Caleb pays one mana for a soul ring and three mana for Neil's Disciple Enforcer. He then pays three more mana for a victory chimes. You really feel like Caleb just did a lot on that turn, especially with that soul ring coming out, being able to play two three mana spells. Mm -hmm. This is only turn four. It's very impressive. Super impressive. At the end step, Nils will trigger and he will put a plus one plus one counter on Lelia with Nils' ability. And in response to this, Griffin taps his steel overseer to give itself a plus one plus one counter. Griffin begins his turn by untapping and drawing and he lays down a mountain and heads into combat. He swings Lelia at Landon, which will trigger both Lelia and Brina. Brina will resolve first, Griffin draws a card and Caleb puts two plus one plus encounters on Brina. Lelia triggers and exiles a chain reaction from the top of Griffin's library and Lelia will also get a plus one plus one counter herself. Landon declares no blocks, takes five damage dropping down to 35. In his second main phase, Griffin pays four mana to cast his commander Oskir the Reconstructor. This commander is very, very efficient because his strategy is fueled by himself at the same time. So he can use his generic ability that doesn't require him to tap to sacrifice the artifacts that you want to copy by tapping him, exiling it from your graver, and creating copies. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps, and in his upkeep, he activates the Druidic Satchel to reveal the top card of his library. Since it is Command Tower a land, he can put it directly into play. He then draws his card for turn and plays down a forest. He then pays four mana for an Epicure of Blood, and with nothing left to do, he passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn and taps three mana for Cassetto Orochimaru Archmage. Caleb then gives Peter one mana from the Victory Chimes, which gives Peter enough mana to pay two more mana to cast a Trigon Predator. With nothing left to do and very grateful to Caleb for the mana, he passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn and heads immediately into combat. He swings Brina at Griffin because Griffin literally asks for it at this point like some weirdo, and Brina triggers Come it. Come at me, bro. Yeah, for real. I guess Griffin likes birds. Brina triggers and Caleb will draw a card and puts two plus one plus one counters on Brina, which brings her up to dealing seven damage to Griffin, dropping him down to 30. He then pays four mana for a hunted Lamasu and gives the 4-4 horror creature token that it makes on ETB to Landon. 
He then heads to his end step, triggering Nils, and he's going to add a plus one plus one counter to the Steel Overseer, the Horror Token, and the Trigon Predator. Griffin untaps and draws, and Phyrexia's core is out of land, yeah. Plays down Phyrexia's core as his land for turn, and pays three mana for a Sculpting Steel. On ETB, he makes it enter as a copy of Caleb's Soul Ring. He taps it and uses one of the mana to activate Oscar's first ability, sacrificing the Sculpting Steel and giving the Steel Overseer plus two plus O. Oh. He then pays three mana to activate Osgear's second ability, exiling the Sculpting Steel from his graveyard, making two copies of the Sculpting Steel. And when they ETB, he will choose the Soul Ring, so now he has two Soul Rings. He heads into combat, swinging Lelia at Peter, which will trigger Lelia and Brina. Caleb is going to draw a card, and he puts two plus one plus one counters on Nils. Lelia exiles a Combustible Gear Hulk from the top of Griffin's library and is going to get a plus one plus one counter. Peter has no blocks and takes the 6 damage, dropping down to 31. In his second main phase, Griffin pays 3 mana for a Scrap Trawler and passes the turn to Landon. We can already see the power of Osgear, the ability to get a Soul Ring and then get 2 more Soul Rings. The mana advantage is just incredible to be able to cast that many spells in one turn and activate the abilities of both the Sacrifice Outlet and the Copy ability on Osgear. Very, very powerful and, and really impressive to see in Boros. Landon untaps and draws and plays down an exotic orchard as his land for turn and pays 6 mana for a taste of death, forcing each player to sacrifice 3 creatures and making Landon 3 food tokens. Caleb responds to this on the stack by casting Oblation, returning Nils into his library and drawing 2 cards. The spell then resolves and everybody sacrifices their creature with only Osgear remaining alone on the battlefield. Scrap Trawler will trigger when it dies and Griffin can return the Steel Overseer to his hand. With nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Peter. I did that to get rid of Brina. I, I really paid 6 mana to get rid of Brina. That's fair, Brina was very scary. I, yeah. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a Rogue's Passage as his land for turn and taps 6 mana for a spawning Kraken. He then goes into his end step, and in that end step, Caleb gives Landon a mana so Landon can activate his Druidic Satchel. He reveals a Leyline Prowler off the top of his library, which will create Landon a Sapling token. Caleb begins his turn by untapping and drawing, and lays down a Study Hall. He then pays 6 mana for a Necropolis Regent. He then pays 3 mana for a Vow of Duty, putting it on the spawning Kraken, making it so it gets plus 2 plus 2 and cannot attack Caleb. It does also give it Vigilance. I don't care. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and pays 3 mana for the very spicy Archaeomancer's map. And on ETB, he's going to search his library for 2 points and put him into his hand. He then plays down a Study Hall as his land for turn and pays 6 mana for a Sun Titan. When the Sun Titan enters the battlefield, he can return Lelia from his graveyard to the battlefield as well. Since Lelia has haste, he heads into combat and swings her at Landon. When she attacks, she exiles the top card of his library, and it is an Alibu, and Lelia will also get a counter. Landon takes the damage, going down to 32. He then pays 2 mana for a Darksteel Mutation, turning Peter's spawning Kraken token into a beetle. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and pays 3 mana for his Leyline Prowler. He then pays 2 mana to activate his Druidic Satchel to reveal a Gluttonous Troll off the top of his library, making him another Sapling token. He then pays 3 mana to cast his commander Willow Dusk the Essence Seer. So what you will see with Willow Dusk is that attempt to lose and gain lots of life, put a lot of plus 1 plus 1 counters on a creature, and make it really big and swole to attack. And with nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays on Novijin Heart of Progress, and this will trigger Griffin's Archaeomancer's map, letting him put a planes from his hand directly onto the battlefield. Caleb then will give Peter a mana with the Victory Chimes, to which he will add two more of his own to cast a Crocean Grip, destroying the Darkstone mutation that is enchanting his spawning Kraken. He then heads into combat, swinging the spawning Kraken at Griffin and activating his Rogue's Passage to make it unblockable. Griffin takes the 8 damage, and on damage, the Kraken triggers and makes a 9 9 token. Griffin then goes down to 22 life. And with nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays on an Opal Palace as his land for turn and pays 5 mana to cast his commander Brina from the command zone for the second time. He then heads into combat, swinging the Necropolis region at Landon, which will trigger his commander, drawing him a card and putting 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Brina. Landon takes the 6 damage and when that connects, the Necropolis region will trigger giving itself 6 plus 1 plus 1 counters. This brings Landon down to 26. Caleb passes the turn back to Griffin. 
Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a planes as his land for turn and then casts Secret Rendezvous, secretly targeting Peter, and they both will draw three cards. He then heads into combat, swinging Lelia and Sun Titan and Osgear all at Caleb. A bunch of triggers here, Lelia exiles a Boros charm from the top of his library, Sun Titan triggers and returns a Darksteel mutation to the battlefield, enchanting the spawning kraken, and Caleb will declare no blockers, and Griffin will cast the Boros charm, giving the Sun Titan double strike, for a total of 20 damage, hitting Caleb right in the face. After some deliberation, Caleb responds, tapping 5 mana for an ink shield, preventing all 20 damage and making 20 to 1 inkling tokens all with flying. That is absolutely ridiculous. That it was the last thing I was expecting. The thing with these the pre-con decks, and especially since we didn't really look up these decks in and out, especially me, I didn't really know what was coming with five mana, and I certainly wasn't expecting all that damage would be prevented and double the amount of power back on the board. So that was a very impressive play by Caleb to hold that much mana open for the ink shield. And in Griffin's second main phase, he taps six mana for a duplicate Exiling the Necropolis Regent on Caleb's side of the board, and Duplicate will enter the battlefield as a 6-5. He then pays 2 mana to redeploy the Steel Overseer from his hand, and passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws. He then pays 6 mana for a Nissa's Renewal, searching his library for a Swamp and 2 Forests, putting them into play tapped, and he also will gain 7 life. He then will pay 2 mana to cast a Sprout Back Trudge with a 7 mana discount because he did gain 7 life this turn. So he gets a 9-7 for 2 mana. Stonks. That seems pretty good, yeah. but how about a 22 ones for 5 mana? Decent. And after that, Landon passes the turn back to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and drops down an island as his land for turn, and Caleb taps his victory chimes, giving Peter an extra mana so he can cast his commander, Adrix and Nev. So this is very straightforward. This is going to be a token deck, and with Adrix on the battlefield, he'll have this parallel lives effect of all of his tokens. Peter then plays two more mana to cast a Coiling Oracle, Revealing an Azuri's Predation off of the top of his library and puts it into his hand. <laughs> that is a major hit off of the Coiling Oracle, and to reveal that to all his opponents is not really the thing that Peter wants to do, because now the whole table can see if he can cast that Azuri's Predation, he will get a ton and a ton of 4-4 four, four beasts that can only die from a couple things on the board, so Peter is going to be left with double the power of anything else. Kayla begins his turn untapping and drawing, and plays down a Bajuka Bog, exiling Griffin's graveyard. Caleb then goes to combat and swings 11 of the Inklings at Griffin, 6 Inklings and Brina at Peter, and Brina will trigger, and Caleb puts 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it and draws a card. Neither have any blocks for the flying Inklings, this will take Griffin out of the game all the way down to 0 life, and Peter will go down to 14. Rip in peace, Griffin. Rip in peace myself. I mean, after I saw that ink shield, I knew exactly what was coming. I was hoping somebody would cast a board wipe to get rid of those two ones. But, you know, if you if you see your opponent create 40 power from you swinging at him for 20, then you, you know what's coming. So my fate was sealed. Well done, Caleb. Well done, Caleb. Very proud of you. In his second main phase, Caleb pays two mana for an arcane signet and two more mana for a bloodthirsty blade. He then pays one mana to equip that Thirsty Blade to Peter's Kraken token, goading it and giving it plus two plus oh. And then he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a Swamp as his land for turn. He sacrifices all three of his food to gain him a hefty nine life. He then activates his commander to put nine plus one plus one counters on his Sproutback Trudge. He heads into combat, swinging Leyline Prowler at Peter, and Peter blocks it with a Coiling Oracle. Landon gains two more life from the Prowler having lifelink, bringing him back up to 41. Landon then pays four mana for an Essence Pulse, gaining him two life and then giving all creatures minus 13, minus 13, since he has gained 13 life this turn, wiping the board of everything except for the Sproutback Trudge. Whew! Big brain play. Huge, powerful play by a Lennon there. The power of Willow Dusk is just very apparent in this turn, while Lennon is just doing what he wants to do anyway by gaining life and giving a huge trampler tons of counters, and then wiping the board leaves him in a very powerful position as the game continues. Let's go. Peter untaps and draws and pays seven mana for a Hornet Queen, making four insects tokens when it enters the battlefield. He then pays two mana for an Idol of Oblivion, which he can then tap to draw a card as he has made a token this turn. He then plays down an Opal Palace as his land for turn and ships the turn back over to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and pays one mana to reattach the Bloodthirsty Blade to Landon's Broughtback Trudge. He then pays seven mana to redeploy his commander, Brina, from the command zone for the third time, and pays two mana for a Keen Duelist and three more mana for Fane the Broker. 
He then ships the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and pays four mana to drop down a gluttonous troll, which when it ETBs will make him two food tokens. He then pays five mana for a marshland bloodcaster and two more mana to activate his satchel. He finds a non-creature non-land card on the top of his library and gains two life, bringing him up to 45. He then heads into combat and swings the trudge at Peter for absolutely lethal. Now Peter makes a very interesting decision here. He chooses not to block the Sprout Bank Trudge, and even though he can kill it with his Death Touch Hornet bugs, he decides not to for the reason that he wants to keep that alive so that Landon continue to take out Caleb. So this is very interesting by Peter, but unfortunately in the crossfire, Peter will take enough damage and be taken down to zero. Also, it should be noted that I didn't have any other choice but to attack Peter because my Sprout Back Trudge was goaded. So it could only have been this way. I'm sorry, Peter. You had a valiant effort. Rip in peace, Peter. But in the end, a goaded trudge will just get you. You know, that's what they say. <laughs> Sometimes you just get got. Caleb untaps, and in his upkeep, the Keen Duelist will trigger, and Landon reveals a Revival Experiment, and Caleb reveals a Martial Impetus. Landon will take 3 damage, and Caleb will take 6, and they both put those cards into their hand. Caleb then draws for turn, and pays 3 mana for a Martial Impetus, putting it on Brina. He then activates Fane to sacrifice the Keen Duelist and give Brina 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. He then pays 5 mana for a Promise of Loyalty. He chooses to put the Vow counter on Brina, and Landon chooses to put a counter on the marshland bloodcaster and then the rest of the creatures on the battlefield are sacrificed and now it should be noted that the marshland bloodcaster can no longer attack caleb caleb then pays three mana for a cunning rhetoric and then he passes the turn to landon this was a very vital point in the game for caleb to be able to get rid of the the troll at least for a little bit was very important to stop him from taking so much damage so well played caleb landon untaps and in his upkeep activates his satchel to reveal guillaume master Shell off the top and he gets a sapling token he then draws and landon then activates the marshland bloodcaster which lets him pay life rather than mana costs for a spell in his hand and he pays six life to cast the revival experiment returning the sprout back troge into play and as a result of casting that spell he will lose three life for returning one spell for a total of nine bringing him down to 33 he then pays 4 mana for Guillaume Master Chef, and in his end step, Guillaume will trigger and he will make 2 food tokens for seeing 2 non-token creatures enter the battlefield this turn. Caleb then untaps and draws and heads to combat, and in response to going into combat, Landon activates Guillaume, sacrificing a food token to tap down Brina and giving her indestructible. With nothing left to do, Caleb passes his combat and passes his turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and in his upkeep, activates his satchel to get a Temple of the False God off the top, putting it directly into play. He then gets to draw his card for turn. He pays 2 mana for Dina, Soul Steeper, and heads directly into combat, swinging Guillaume and Sprout Pack Trudge at Caleb. This triggers Caleb's cunning rhetoric, and he exiles Tavash Gloom Summoner from the top of Landon's library, and he now has the ability to cast that spell on his turn if he wants. Caleb takes 14 damage, dropping down to 20. Landon then passes his turn, and this triggers Guillaume, making him a food token. And then Caleb begins his turn by untapping and drawing. He pays 4 mana for a combat calligrapher, and 4 mana to cast Tavash Gloom Summoner. He heads to combat, and again, like last turn, Landon activates Guillaume, sacrificing some food to tap down, Brina giving it indestructible. He then passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps, and in his upkeep, he activates the handy dandy satchel to get a swamp off the top, putting it directly into play. He then draws his card for turn. He activates the Marshland Bloodletter to cast a Moldervine Reclamation for 5 life, bringing him down to 28. He then activates his commander Willow Dusk to put 5 counters on his sapling token. He then activates Guillaume twice, sacrificing 2 foods to tap down the last two of Caleb's creatures. He then heads to combat, swinging enough for lethal at Caleb, knocking him out of the game. Rip in peace, Caleb. Rip in peace, Caleb. And with that, the game ends with Landon standing on top with the Willow Dusk Essence Seer Precon deck. Well done, Landon. Thank you. These Precon decks are just really, really good. Potent. What do you think, yeah. Landon? No, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I think that these decks are really well put together. It, it felt like everybody was doing stuff. It didn't feel like anybody was just like dirtling or just do nothing. I think everybody was threatening some type of game winning board state throughout the game. Peter with his uh, Kraken making Kraken. Uh, Caleb had Brina who was just an absolute threat. Griffin with his just absolute value town Ozgear and my ability to just make absolutely huge creatures and tap down threats and just also just churn out lots of value with my satchel and stuff, I was really impressed. I, I was also very impressed. These Precon decks are much more impressive than the ones I've seen for the last couple of years. 
and I'm very happy to see the way that these these decks have played. Normally, a commander game runs between somewhere to 9 to 11 turns, and precon games tend to be a lot longer than that, running from anywhere from 13 to 15 turns. But this was a solid 12 turn game, which is very, very nice to see for a complete precon match. Uh, all right, Landon, what did you think was the play of the game here? Ink Shield. Ink Shield was the yeah, play. Yeah, Ink game. Shield was a very impressive play. I think yeah. that was the one. Honestly, <laughs> you don't really find those those plays a lot in commander normally it's just like a fog or something you're like all right well damage was prevented i think i'm fine but to have your damage prevented and make double the power that you know is going to come back at yeah i mean that was just so impressive and i knew at that point that was the end for me the reason why i think it's the play of the game is actually it's it was the turn after the ink shield when caleb took out you and basically peter i don't think i could have taken caleb you and peter with my deck but I think my deck stood a really good chance one-on-one -on -one with Caleb. So that's why I think it was the play of the game. I think that decided the outcome of the game. I think Caleb killing you and bringing Peter down to such a low life total is actually what won me the game. I think he probably should have killed me, but that's hindsight. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe you were threatening a pretty uh, potent next turn. No, I didn't. Uh, honestly, in my hand and, and, and in that deck specifically, there's nothing that's really game ending. Uh, like in a lot of the other decks. So I wasn't really threatening the win at any point. I was just slowly accruing value, especially with that Sun Titan and with Ozgear and the Layla. But I, I do think that sending the, sending the sign that says, hey, if you're going to swing at me for 20, I'm going to swing at you for the, the win. 40. <laughs> Enough to win. Crazy. <laughs> All right. What do you think the MVP card of the game was? Here, I'm going to have to say it was Guillaume, Master Chef. I think the, the ability to be able to tap down Caleb's creatures and at instant speed, sacrificing your food tokens, that allowed you to be able to clear in damage without anything stopping you. And that's definitely what I feel was the, the card of the game that allowed you to take that win. Yeah, I mean, we could easily say it was Ink Shield, but that was the play of the game. So I also think that it was the Satchel. That Satchel smoothed out so many of my turns when I was short on lands, gave me some blockers. Honestly, I, I think the Satchel did work, but I, I think Guillaume is probably going to take the MVP in my opinion. But now the question is, what do you guys think? Let us know in the comment section below what you guys thought was the play of the game or the card of the game. It seems like there's a lot of debate on the card of the game, so it'd be very interesting to see what you guys thought of as the MVP card of the game. All right, to finish us off, a couple of reminders. First off, I definitely think that you guys should pick up these decks if you haven't already. And if you need to get them and you don't have a game store nearby, then considering going to Game Grib's website, which will be in the show notes below where you can order them and get them shipped directly to your house. Another huge shout out to Dragon Shield for letting us be able to play with these awesome Hogwarts sleeves. We honestly love them. We use Dragon Shield for all of our commander games. So to give us these sleeves to show to you guys is really, really great of an opportunity. We thank them. So if you want these sleeves, they will be releasing to the public on May 28th. So make sure you go out there and get a set of these sleeves for your commander decks. And if you guys are interested in supporting us directly and having access to a bunch of the cool perks, access to our Discord, access to merch, other things like that, you can head on over to our patreon.com slash command valley to sign up today and to join one of our ranks and really reap in those benefits. We have a ton of fun over on our Patreon and it'd be awesome to get more people to play with us throughout throughout the month so we would appreciate that all right friends with that that is the end of this game so thank you so much for watching to the end we really appreciate you and we invite you to stick around subscribe to our channel and, and stay tuned for when you get to see us build some of these commanders in the decks but really tune them up to their full potential that'll be really exciting so and we'll see you for the next game feeling very happy with his new swag oh my gosh i can't believe i said that Feeling very, I'm not going to say anything. I can't even take myself seriously after Come that. Come on. No, I'm not going to. It's Gucci. It's a Gucci satchel. It's a Gucci bag. Louis Vuitton. Yeah. Druidic yeah. Gucci.